there, what we do is exempt things not so neatly put in a box. And we will do that this evening. My guest following Linda Howe, who has a report on HARP, one that many of us have been waiting for, the HARP project in Alaska, will be Ted Flynn. And uh, he will uh, help you do an examination of prophecy, as the Catholics see it, between now and just a little bit after the year 2000. So that's the lineup for this evening. I think you're going to enjoy it. Get a cup of coffee, sit down by the radio, and prepare yourself. We're uh, we're going to be doing uh, uh, doing a lot of things uh, uh, this evening, so uh, get yourself set. Many of you help now, and I believe she's got something on Project Harp. Good evening, Linda. Yeah, all right. Yeah, this past week, Sonoma State College in California announced on National Public Radio the results of its project censored a list of ten most important stories of 1994 that went largely ignored by the general media. On that list of ten important stories was Project HARP, which I have reported about since last fall. HARP is the government acronym for High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, originally run as a joint program by the Navy and Air Force through Phillips Laboratory at Hanscom Air Force Base near Boston, Massachusetts. Its stated public goal is to create the world's most powerful ionospheric heater, which will beam power at the ionosphere for a variety of uses, including communications with submarines and aircraft, and 3D imaging of the North American continent to book for, quote, underground tunnels, structures, and shelters, all of this taking place from a site in Gakona, Alaska. Uh, Linda, let me interrupt just for a second. Uh, Underground... Tunnels and shelters. Right. Well, the man I interviewed uh, gets into this, and remember when I talked with program manager John Hetcher four months ago, uh, he described this wording that was in the 1995 defense authorization budget in a Senate bill in which uh, Hetcher, the program manager for HARP, explained to us that he had no congressional funding for 1995 without Pentagon approval from its counter-proliferation division, which was supposed to embrace this idea of looking for underground tunnels, shelters, and structures, because, as Hector said, someone had put that wording in the Senate uh, Defense Authorization Bill as being imperative to uh, harp going forward, but he himself said he was not certain about what those words intended. Now, so far, we're at April, and in the last four months, residual 1994 monies have been used to test harp in Dakota, Alaska, even firing the equipment up to one gigawatt of radiated power. Today, I talked with a co-author of a new book, about Project Harp scheduled for July release entitled Angels Don't Play the Harp, spelled H-A-A-R-P, a new look at Tesla Technologies by Nick Begich and Gene Manning. Nick Begich was born and raised in Alaska as the eldest son of the late Alaska Congressman and United States Senator Nick Begich Sr., who disappeared without a trace along with Congressman Hale Boggs on October 16, 1973, in a private plane en route between Anchorage and Juneau. Since then, Nick Begich Jr. has had a great concern in the inf- on environmental issues in Alaska, is currently employed by the Anchorage School District, and has devoted uh, several years now to studying issues in Alaska and felt that Project Harp was too important not to devote a lot of uh, time and research to and has produced this book with uh, Gene Manning. Today, he talked to me about the evolution of HARP from its beginning in a company called Arco Power Technologies, Inc., uh, also known as APTI, to new ownership this month, April 1995, by the huge defense contractor named Raytheon, and this is Nick Um, That report now from Linda Howe. Eventually. Here it comes. I don't know why it's not uh, 
It's not, re- it's not reporting. Well, it, it should. Hmm, that's strange. Just a minute, I'm everything was playing before fine. Uh, there's a guy named hmm. Murphy knows all about this. <laughs> I don't know what's happened here. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, okay, Arthur. Okay. Okay, here we go. What originally occurred with, uh, you know, with, with uh, our technology is, first of all, APTI was formed in 1986. Um, 85, 86, and it was formed around the ideas of Bernard Eastland. Um, what happened is Arco Atlantic Richfield Corporation formed a subsidiary basically to develop these patents, which are essentially a ground-based Star Wars system. Okay. That's the only way you can describe it. And APTI stood for? Uh, they just stood for Arco Power Technologies Incorporated. Okay. And that was the lab that Hector at the at Hanscom Air Force Base and Phillips Laboratory, they were working in coordination with APTI on the development of arms. Correct. And what happened is APTI was a nothing organization. The only thing they owned was a couple of government grants, 12 patents, and that's it. They never made a profit. And yet they come in and, and they show in the, uh, in the record that their annual sales, whatever that means, was $5 million a year, and yet they come in, they compete against Raytheon, one of the biggest companies in the world, and Penn State for this contract to construct part. And they win the contract, which at the first phase was $25 million, and the second phase estimated at $150 million. So how does a $5 million company out of nowhere come in and grab this five government contract? The only way they can do it is if they have proprietary information of such a nature that that's what the government wants to develop, and the only way they're going to get it developed is to bring these guys on board. Which were the patents. Which were the patents. And so APTI swings into the game. They get they get through, you know, and they were looking for a way to generate huge amounts of power because Arco Power Technologies, mother company, Arco, owns trillions of cubic feet of natural gas on the North Slope of Alaska, which most of these patents site as the ideal location for the construction of these particular kinds of facilities. So they get the contract, they go into the first phase, they, they get to the, near the completion of the first phase, and E-Systems comes in and buys them out. This was June 10, 1994, according to the New York Times article that we were able to find on the subject. And could you please explain E-Systems? E-Systems does $2.1 billion in annual sales, $1.8 billion, according to an article in the Washington Post in October of 94. $1.8 billion is for NSA, CIA, and military security organizations. Of that, $800 million are black projects, projects so secret, not even the Congress knows what they're for, but they're funding them. So E-System, and they were recently in February, um, were featured on 60 Minutes as one of these you know, super secret, quiet companies that nobody hears anything about that are huge amounts of taxpayer money being plowed in the program. I mean, the, the company was founded to provide CIA a vehicle to work work through to develop technology, and they, and they developed this huge, huge uh, base uh, to work from. And then what, what happened? April 3rd of this year, Raytheon, who at the time was 52 on the Fortune 500 list, a huge, huge military contractor. Uh, most of their profits derived from military contracts for missile systems. Bought e systems out, lock, stock, and barrel, 41% over the currently traded market price on the stock. So essentially, they, APTI, the Bloomberg Software Company, gets absorbed by this huge company, e systems, that gets absorbed by an even larger alligator, Raytheon. And now you've got APTI's measly 12 patents buried in the midst of thousands of patents and huge government projects, and yet what is what is Raytheon gained by this is a huge, huge jump in technology here for weapon systems, for weapon systems, defense systems. Uh, Based on those patents that APTI are. Absolutely. And is he admitting that it is Tesla technology? No, they are still denying that any of this is tied together, and when you measure their words in the various departments of the government against the words within the contact contract and technology in the past, there's no mistake in what this is. They can deny it all they want, but the facts speak for themselves. And anyone who reviews these patents will come to the same conclusion that we have, is this is not the kind of technology we want administered in the United States without oversight by independent to see what effects it might have on the things who live here. Why do they 
they want to do 3D imaging of the Northern Hemisphere. Well, there were, say, um, underground nuclear facilities in the Soviet Union, and we had a non-proliferation agreement with the Soviet Union, and we decided by mutual agreement that we would position um, hardware on the ground in the various countries under the agreement, and then using this broadcast system, we would be able to detect any underground facility so that we would know where they were and if they were lying or anyone was cheating on these agreements. So, you know, or we could use it in a, in a, in a more localized area like in, uh, in Iraq right now with it. In fact, Hector brought this up in our interview with them, that wouldn't it be nice to be able to take this technology to Iraq and find out where all these underground facilities are? And the answer, yeah, it probably would be nice to find out where, but maybe this isn't the way we want to do it because the spin-off of that using this technology might be so dangerous that, you know, we might be hurting ourselves in doing that and we might be hurting a lot of other people that are innocent. But it, it is applicable to things like the Middle East and finding underground structures where Saddam Hussein is hiding out or others. Why is it that counterproliferation in the Pentagon has not embraced for us so far to get funding going forward? That's, you know, that's an interesting question, and I really, I can't fathom the answer. I mean, the, the only thing that I can think of is it's a big project. There's a limited amount of money, and perhaps something that they weren't brought in on at the beginning, and they may have some resistance to, you know, to, to spinning off a chunk of that money to some new technology that they really haven't been a part of developing. But when even went after the technology that applied for the patent, originally it was declined, and he had to go in and prove that to the satisfaction the patent examiner that it worked. And as soon as he proved it worked, the Office of Naval Research sealed it under a secrecy order for a year. <laughs> well, they played games with it, and then they released it, and then, um, and then we have hunt. And here we are. So, Dick Begich and Dean Manning will just publish their new book about Project Hunt in July. And uh, I have a number art, uh, for a mailing list they're putting together. Uh, because they are doing this book on their own, uh, because they feel it is so important to get information about this out. All right. Uh, go right ahead. And the uh, number for information about this uh, new book uh, is area code 907 in Anchorage, Alaska, mm -hmm. and the number is 249-911-0001. Again, 907- Two four nine nine one one one, and the title is "Angels Don't Play the Harp: <laughs> A New Look at Tesla Technology." Angels don't play the harp. Yep. All right. Uh, that's excellent. When uh, we want to, everybody wants to know more. Well, I'm going to keep at it. And one of the interesting footnotes is. Nick Begich has tried as a Alaska citizen working in a school system in Anchorage to get Senator Stevens of Alaska to give him any information that Senator Stevens has on the process and the project of HARP and has not gotten any returns to his call. And to date, I have called Senator Stevens' office in Washington at least a dozen times. I have talked with administrative assistants and been telling them I would like to at least get on the record from uh, the horse's mouth the uh, senator in Alaska who would be involved with uh, at least, I would think, some of the funding efforts for HARP. And to date, I cannot get a response. Well, I do not know if that means that Senator Stevens is nervous about this Linda, or what. Linda, you're on the air all over Alaska right now. Right. So if you know, if you want to encourage Alaskans to do something, now's the time. Right, and I think that writing Senator Stevens in Washington D.C. is certainly an important step, and also getting in touch with Nick Beckett and Gene Manning at the uh, number I just gave out, and for people who also would like to get in touch with me uh, about uh, any news concerning heart or any news in any of the phenomena that we cover on Dreamland. I welcome your correspondence to me, Linda Howe, at Post Office Box 538 in Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania. The zip code is 19006, and my fax number is area code 215-491-9842. And maybe later on in the program you might give that out again, Art. I will. And uh, I will stay on, Art, and... 
keep up, I hope, with all these other interesting stories that are unfolding around us now concerning well, Roswell and, and others. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Linda. We'll talk with you next week. Okay. Take care. That's Linda Howe, and uh, she is probably the world's foremost expert on crop circles and animal mutilations. Now, this comes from the Internet, and I'm going to read it to you as is, with one addendum. Flash, for immediate release, time urgent news. Be aware that on Friday, April 28th, British TV documentary producer Ray Santilli Possessor of the Roswell 1947 saucer crash retrieval and ET autopsy military film, will hold a world press conference to reveal, uh, reveal what films show. Colin Andrews has seen the film and has been given a clip. He is told Sergeant Major Robert Dean he thinks the film is authentic. A copy of the film is now being examined by a pathologist MD from the British Home Office, the equivalent here in the U.S. of the State Department, the British Broadcasting Corporation is producing a TV documentary on the film that Mr. Santilli possesses. Now, that date, April 28th, may have been changed to May 5th. Linda Howe is going to try to get an interview with Mr. Santilli to air on this program next week. Don't Miss it. No guarantee about that, but she is actively uh, pursuing that. Also, um, I want to uh, I'll drop this in very quickly. Uh, there are um, about 14 pictures or photographs now, computer photographs, that are available. And there are now four or five uh, what are called nodes to serve you. So if you have had a diff difficult time getting through to get these computer gifts, Try again. Here's the information. Um, the bulletin board service with all of these related photographs, uh, ghost photographs, the photographs of the Mexican UFOs, the Roswell film photograph, uh, the face on Mars photograph, uh, the ghost in Louisiana photograph, the Billy Meyer saucer photograph, and uh, so many more, uh, many photographs of myself, my wife, and uh, as a matter of fact, there's one in there of me when I was 13. Here's how you get them. It should be easier to get through now with more notes. Area code 702-727-1709. It's open 24 hours a day. 702, uh, let's see, area code 702-727-1709. When you get to the main menu, after giving your name and such, simply hit J space 11. J space 11. We'll be right back. Do you remember it? Each day, more than 3,000 American children smoke their very first cigarette. I didn't know that. Is that an accurate statistic? Nationally, at least 3.1 million adolescents are smokers. Oh, you must be kidding. I'm not. The majority of smokers are hooked before they're 15 years old. No. That's not possible. Yes, it is. Smoking, an equal opportunity killer. Sponsored by the Illinois Coalition Against the Back. How much do you think it would cost to have your home protected by an electronic security system? $300, $400? Well, here's great news. Now you can get home electronic security system for as low as $99 installed. Plus a monthly monthly. You're hearing Greenland with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at 702-727-1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. It certainly is. Good evening, everybody. Dreamland underway. Ted Finn coming up in a moment. I've got something for those of you who like looking over the edge. This is a good idea. It's called UFO Facts World Report, and it's a brand new monthly newsletter that comes to you not late because of the mail, but uh, it comes to you over your fax machine. <laughs> That's a good idea. Giving you access to hard-hitting, no-nonsense information about the latest in UFO happenings in your area and around the world. 
latest sightings, latest developments in abductions and encounters. For just $19.95 a year, you'll have access to all this information distilled into an objective and concise report written by seasoned journalists and packed full of facts. UFO Facts plugs you into what's going on. It's your access to the best thinkers and analysts on the subject. UFO Facts critiques the latest books, keeps you informed about upcoming convention seminars taking place in your state. Plus, you get advance notice of lectures in your local area. Find out what's happening at the government level and what's happening worldwide. Call 1-800-830-9830. That's 1-800-830-9830. Your UFO Facts World Report newsletter carries an unconditional money-back guarantee from the publishers. We give that to you just in numbers. It's 1-800-830-9830. Okay, we're just a little bit behind uh, commercially here, so... One more moment, Ted Flynn, and a fire and watch heat up wet. Adding up. All right. Now, to Ted Flynn, and um, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm not even sure where Ted is. Ted, first of all, welcome to the program. Thank you. Where are you, Ted? I am right now in my home in uh, Herndon, Virginia, where I reside. Herndon, Virginia. Which is about uh, 20, 25 miles right outside uh, Washington, D.C., uh, very close to actually Dallas Airport. You're probably not very far from that uh, uh, now famous monkey house. Uh, are you the one where the uh, Ebola virus was thought to have gotten out? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, they wrote a book on that. I think it was called Hot Zone. That's right. And uh, from the next town is Reston, Virginia. I thought you that's might be where close. we're about a whopping uh, five minutes from that. I see. Well, it would have taken about a whopping five minutes, I suppose, for that awful thing to have reached you had it been... Uh, uh, something that infected uh, humans. Boy, that was an awful story. You know, it's amazing. You know, uh, I've been in the, the nation's capital area now for about 17, 18 years. And, uh, you know, we'd be the last to know from everything that I've seen. You know, I hate to agree with that, but I think that too. They wouldn't tell us. No. Um, all right, Ted, uh, we've had people like Gordon Michael Scallion on this program. I, I don't know whether you're familiar with that name or not. Yes, I am. He does prophecy. I'm going to have him back on May 5th, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, but he has prophesized some terrible things uh, regarding earth movement, earthquakes, that sort of thing. Um, and not very far uh, into the future. And I have this terrible feeling that uh, the secular uh, prophecy and religious prophecy are coinciding in some way. Um, I said to you the other day, and I think it's a great way to open up the uh, program tonight, that there had been a report, and it is confirmed, by the way, Ted, of 33-pound pieces of hail falling uh, in in one of China's lower provinces. It uh, aired Friday night on the Associated Press. I've got the story. 33 pounds. They said it crushed homes. It killed people, quite a number of people and uh, uh, damaged it and turned over cars. So it is a confirmed report. That's biblical-sized hail, Ted. Yeah, that's really large. That's big. And your comment to me, I recall, was you ain't seen nothing yet or something close. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, uh, the, the geological problems right now and the atmospheric problems are on a worldwide scale. Um, over the last uh, just several years, let's not even go five back, but just several, you've had uh, all sorts of water problems in Holland, which is only one of two countries in the world below sea level. It is true. Uh, you've had problems in the Rhine in Germany, the Dnieper in Ukraine, the Seine in France. Uh, let's not get into anything in the United States, which is, you know, we know those, the Hurricane Andrews, the Arctic cold, uh, you know, the, the California quakes. If you take a look at this from a spiritual dimension, um, if you looked at the ten plagues of Egypt, uh, you know, of Moses, uh, it started out, uh, you know, to the, the, the first plague that went from gadflies to frogs to locusts to blood in the, blood in the river, uh, to hail, 
and then you know the ninth plague of, of Moses was um, uh, three days of darkness over the land of Egypt, and the tenth was even death to Pharaoh's son. If you're looking at it biblically speaking, we are seeing increasing in intensity and severity of all sorts of geological and atmospheric problems around the world. And you've got to remember the the natural phenomena is subordinate to the spiritual realm, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. And that um, these sorts of, of things are happening right now on a global scale. And this is what we've been able to see over the last several years. And it's increasing every year in intensity. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, it doesn't surprise me to hear that at all. Uh, that because, you know, I personally think that these things are going to just, you know, be much more natural phenomena because these are the signs of our times from a spiritual standpoint. When I talk to uh, lay people uh, who do this sort of prophecy, they will say frequently, uh, for example, in the case of Gordon Michael Stallion, I see three possible futures. Um, I see one more clear- clearly than the other. And that's the one that most frequently comes true. That's what he told us. And uh, and yet he will also say, it is not something that has to be. It is a future that, given uh, the right sort of behavior and change of behavior, can be changed. How do you view uh, a future? Is our future fixed? Is it uh, as suggested in the Bible and nothing? It will change that. Our behavior, our Vibes, uh, whatever, nothing will change that, Ted. Well, you've gotten right into the heart of the matter, Gerard. <laughs> um, in 1961, there were uh, a lot of apparitions and locutions and that sort of thing around the world that were talked about that if, if things didn't change in the world, there would be chastisements coming to the world. And this is truly, you know, from the Catholic perspective, which is, you know, what we write about. Yes. Which I, you know, the thing that we're finding now more and more amazing is that a lot of these prophecies line up with other people, that they're using different circumstances and different events, but nonetheless, the final outcome is strikingly similar, stunningly similar for that matter of fact. It is. And that's the part that, you know, it literally is some of the reasons what we did. It appears right now that as long as certain uh, things are going on in the world, in essence, sin. As long as this is happening on the scale that it's happening, there will be these things, and the die seems to be cast. Unless there is, right now, what is a remarkable turnaround in the spiritual life of the world, and I think the West is a little bit more culpable because it's had free choice. It, it's had the ability to make moral decisions without a totalitarian or fascist regime, regime or communist state uh, you know, telling it what to do with citizens. It's a very interesting perspective. I the, West the West is more responsible and more culpable. It, it, it has had the ability mm-hmm. to make choices and has chosen the wrong path. This is the reason why it seems the die is cast. And unless this spiritual state is reversed, what appears to be very, very rapidly, it seems as if they will happen. Um, what are the aggravating circumstances, uh, Chad? There are, uh, I think, about 1.5, 1.6 million abortions a year uh, now in America. I take it your view would be that's a big aggravating circumstance. It is the single greatest. What we have done is we have compiled uh, in what is a mini encyclopedia in the form of stories from apparition sites and that sort of thing around the world. And it happened actually by mistake, but the, the way we did, why we did it, because we just saw some trends. And the thing that we saw throughout, as long as abortion exists, uh, there will not be change in the severity and in the intensity of these chastisements or tribulations to the world will actually increase, not decrease. Okay. You mentioned 1.5 million here. Uh, we've had what is estimated since Roe v. Wade in 1973. Uh, over 35 million plus. But that's just here in the United States. In the former Soviet Union, where I was in and out of over 14 to 15 times for up to a month at a clip in 1990 through 1994, very frequently, because of some projects I was involved in, 
uh, the average number of abortions in the former Soviet Union, those 15 republics of about 285 million people, the average number of abortions per woman is seven. Oh my God. The NOBGYN over there is simply an abortion. And, and I don't think I ever met uh, an individual, a family or a woman, who had not had an abortion. So it's, 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 not, it's not just America, then. It's no, and that, that's it. You know, uh, we tend, when we leave our home in the morning, we go to our place of employment, we go to our ball field, we have our entertainment, we have our exercise, we have our routine. We can many times think that the world is basically you know, from our home to our office and the gas station in between. It's a big world out there. There's 5.2 billion people. And basically, the moral state of the world is, in, in the East, it's as bad as in the West. What we have lost through affluence, we have lost all sense of divinity and spirituality in the West through principally affluence that we, we think we no longer need that. Uh, the East has lost it in suffering. So collectively, we are principally right now a lost world, and that is the reason why some of these things seem to be happening. These and, are the signs of the times around us. And America is the uh, the greater violator because of its affluence, because well, of its uh, its ability to choose its freedom. Well, you know, America and the West. I don't think you can separate a lot of other places. You know, especially Europe, where you have such a high standard of living. But, uh, you know, you speak about things of biblical proportions, like, you know, the, the tale. Uh, nations uh, all through history, if you've looked at Toynbee, uh, who have traced the story of civilization, the historian Arnold Toynbee, as a nation has reached affluence, it has by and large lost its sense of divinity and spirituality because in its own mind, it doesn't think it needs that because it's become independent through its affluence. It doesn't matter the day. Uh, there was an explosion, as you well are aware, in Oklahoma City, killing many, many, many people. In retaliation, we believe, for uh, something the government did in Waco, Texas, where many burned. Uh, it seems now a cycle of retribution and violence. In Rwanda, I turned on the television earlier tonight, they now think as many as 8,000 were killed, and they're throwing them into mass graves. This uh, was just in the last day or two, I think there were That's That's right, Chad. Uh, you pick the day. You pick the day, and uh, it's becoming more violent. It's becoming uh, more hard, more difficult to understand. I call it the quickening. Events uh, uh, appear worldwide to be accelerating uh, at a very rapid pace, Ted, accelerating, uh, quickening, if you will. And uh, I take it that's right right in line with what you see coming. It's impossible right now for us to process, for instance. We're a generation that has images flashed to us, the movies are fast, the action is fast, and it's the MTV generation which is being even duplicated on the network type things of constant action. It's impossible for our mind to even begin to process what's happening. Uh, you know, in, in, unless we see the news in Rwanda, but, you know, we, we can't know. But it's happening at a great next speed. It's virtually impossible yes. to begin to even process of how quick this is all happening. And what is in the social realm, the political, the economic, the religious, et cetera, et cetera. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, Chad, I'll note something else for you, and maybe this fits right in. I've got an affiliate uh, in Oklahoma City where this horrible thing occurred. The people in Oklahoma City are still very much in shock and sorrow and grief. The rest of the nation, while still uh, very upset about this, has been watching it now for days on their television. The television brings us an endless series of disasters and human misery on a scale that's hard to comprehend. And frankly, people begin to get numb. They get numb. So uh, we have different reactions. One in Oklahoma City, where it's really occurring and the scale of misery is hard to even understand. And another in the rest of the nation, where they watch the children burning Waco. They watch similar disasters, uh, perhaps not quite the same, every single day. And they begin to get numb. So the reaction of the rest of the country seems to be somewhat different and more numbed than, uh, than that in Oklahoma City. 
I can't, hold on just one moment. Contemplate what I just said, and you may want to react to it. We'll be right back. Are you interested in past lives, Gene eight one eight cs There is a nationwide shortage, and we're afraid soon. Uh, back to Ted Flynn. Uh, Ted, we're not far from the top of the hour. A chastisement. Um, I'm not a deeply religious person, so you're going to have to help me through a lot of this, Ted. Chastisement, I take it that means big pieces of hail and so forth? Well, that would be the physical form of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, if you were right now in Somalia, uh, you'd think you're in chastisement. If you're in Bosnia, Herzegovina, Haiti, and about a hundred other places in the world where there's either border skirmishes, wars, internal fractions, etc., and somebody was sniping at you, that would be a chastisement. But the part I don't understand, Ted, is, if anything, they're generally the innocents compared, say, to the way you uh, portrayed people in this country, uh, rich, um, possibly even some greedy, no doubt, uh, uh, a country that's lost track uh, primarily of its spiritual self. Uh, you would think if there was going to be be big chastisement, they ought to be here, not not on the poor people in Somalia. Well, uh, that would be the very logical part of that, mm-hmm. but uh, it, it's difficult to exp- explain many times the logic and the reason for when and where and, and how. Uh, you know, you were just mentioning before you get off the, uh, you know, the Oklahoma thing that we've been seeing now on the news every single evening. Um, What's happening right now to where, you know, around the world, we're really becoming desensitized to a lot of this, this yes. material because we're seeing it so, so frequently. There's a numbing. Yes. And this is why kids can go out and shoot kids. And, you know, kids are bringing in a classroom, a pistol, a notebook, and a pad, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, they've got only a few things just right around here. Uh, just in the next county, um, last week, uh, a gun went off in the classroom. And this is not isolated stuff. Uh, you're going to begin to see more and more violence, even greater than what is happening right now uh, around the world, and it's going to be principally focused on the inner cities because of the, you know, the, the tension that exists there. But this sort of stuff, you know, this, this when you are as a nation, let's just take the United States. In 1962, we took prayer out in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Uh, yet they say a prayer in Congress before every session. They do. They say they allow it there, but in a classroom you can't have any sort of even a moment of silence legally. 1973, we had Roe versus Wade, which legalized abortion in the United States. The roots of violence are centered in spiritual things. That if, if there isn't any sort of spiritual dimension in a person's life, the fruits are what we're now seeing in Oklahoma and in Waco and other parts of the world. There's a total of a person's identity uh, from spiritual. So that's why you're seeing the news like it is every night. But when you were brought up, I'll bet, you know, you could leave your bike on your front lawn and, uh, you know, you were able to... Uh, oh, Ted, it's, it's true. It's, it's not the same America um, anymore. We'll be back with Ted Flynn in just a moment. <laughs> The Thunder of Justice. It's about Catholic prophecy. And you know something? When I was much younger, I guess the biggest scare that I've ever had in my whole life was a movie called The Exorcist. Never will I forget that. It is imprinted in my mind indelibly. And I'm not exactly sure why it scared me the way it did. I think... It had to do with the fact that the Catholic Church does do exorcisms. That it happened. And that it, well, I just don't know. I can't tell you why, but I've seen all manner of horror movies that you can imagine. And that scared me the most. And somehow, uh, this morning's program fits into that category. Ghosts, goblins, things that go bump in the night. But somehow or another, when they're connected to the church, it's really scary. Then to the news, this hour was full of Rwanda. Thousands of victims being plowed into shallow graves. 
death on a scale we can't imagine. And then they, they wound it up with a story that I think is worth repeating. You will go figure on this one, but up in the northeast part of the country, at some gathering, there was some fellow who dressed up as Big Bird. You know what Big Bird is? You know, PPS Big Bird. Everybody knows what Big Bird is. For some reason unexplainable, a lot of youth uh, began to swear at this costumed Big Bird and then ended up attacking him with baseball bats. Baseball bats. Big Bird, Rwanda, prophecy, moral deterioration. We'll get back to Ted Flynn in just a moment. Something good that you can do, uh, and, and I'm so glad to be advertising this, is uh, absolutely fresh flowers. When you send flowers to anybody, you do something really good it's from the heart, and, uh, and oh, it's, it, it, it really does something for somebody. You know, when they get this incredible, I mean, any flowers, women love flowers, any flowers are great. But when you send absolutely fresh flowers, uh, you magnify the effect. Here's the deal, it's simple, $39.95. $39.95. They go out and then they cut flowers, plenty of buds. They can pack them into these, uh, a very tight bunches, and pack them in this large triangular box. More flowers than she's ever seen in her whole life. Simply uh, because you're ordering from a flower farm, you're buying them at a wholesale rate. That's why you get that kind of deal. Try it. Secretary's Week is this week. Anniversaries, birthdays, it doesn't matter. Try this number. Try it. Trust me. one 800 Five six two six four three eight. Twenty four hours a day. One eight hundred five six two six four three eight. Now back to Ted Flynn. Ted, uh, I intentionally left the pot up on the news uh, so that you could hear it, uh, and you must have heard roughly what I heard. If there is a, uh, uh, if these are in times, uh, I, I, I just think that listening to each newscast. Uh, underscores everything you've been saying. Do you feel that way? Absolutely. You know, uh, the thing, you know, I'm actually in finance and marketing with living in, in, uh, Europe, uh, former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, over, you know, really about the last five, five years. And, you know, this isn't something that we, you know, woke up one day and said, listen, let's write a book on this. But we, we had had a magazine that uh, wrote about a lot of this phenomena on a, on a quarterly basis. It was my wife's magazine. It's called Times of the Time. And the thing that struck us most was to see the similarities of these messages, to see that this material, uh, Waco, Texas, the, uh, the thing that I guess that cult leader was just dead, death, as we just heard. The sarin gas attacks. I mean, we could it go goes on. on and on and on. This material that these people have been speaking about, which we call the Catholic prophets. And by the way, they're in, they're in the major religion. They're, they're people who, all throughout the world, saying much of the same thing. Um, that this material is, is tomorrow night's news, it's, it's, it's next month's news, it's next year's news, and it's going to be news in five years, in three, four, five years. We're going to have famine. We're going to have more race wars. We are going to have a crash that is on an, an, an economic crash that is that is going to be huge. The entire world is tied into you know each other right now. Uh, during the what was it 1987 October 87, where the traders in New York were watching their screens of what was happening on the Nikkei and Hang Seng. And, they were looking at the London Exchange. They were all around the world because our economies are all tied into each other, the major automotive companies. Ted, let me interrupt with an example that will really underscore this. John Major in England, uh, in Britain, uh, about a less than a month ago, said that the world is so intertied with computers and satellites now, economically, that um, no nation state will be able to stand by itself 
And uh, he said $1 trillion can change hands overnight and that events are occurring at such a rapid pace economically that um, uh, the entire world's fate is tied together. So that has already occurred. The setup for what you're talking about is already in place. The stage is totally set. Yeah. The, uh, you know, we could get into any country. I was just in Canada a month ago. Um, as a nation, the Canadians uh, have twice the debt per capita as, as we do in the United States. Now, they're very, very small. We could be, yes, they were, I guess, about 90% of them are within uh, about 100 miles of the U.S. border. Now, if you want to take a look at Mexico, where we just gave through the IMF and government guarantees and loans about $20 billion. If we gave Mexico $20 billion tomorrow morning, they'll need another $50 billion by dinner. As a matter of fact, nothing is going to turn Mexico around. That's right. Far going. That's right. The twenty billion didn't even. There was a one-day spike in the Mexican stock market, and the peso kept right on falling. I just came back uh, last Wednesday from being in Puerto Rico, Santo Domingo, in the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, and Panama. I spent fourteen days in those four places cumulatively. And the stories that I was hearing about Mexico were almost unbelievable economically to where in one state in Mexico alone, uh, 5,000 restaurants are closing, more closed. And this is the man that I was with in Panama who was born and brought up in Mexico. His family's still in Mexico, and he is a very large distributor of goods in the canal zone up in the Colon area. And uh, the stage is set economically, politically, socially, uh, or, you know, and financially to where we're all tied in. And when one goes, the other has to prop them up. Yes. And this is, in essence, what is being spoken about. We really have a one-world government and a one-world financial system right now pretty much put in place. And uh, this is why the messages are saying what they're saying, because we're in deep trouble. And, you know, take what's happening in Southern California, Northern California with floods and a great deal of the country's produce. I've actually heard it's a very, very high percentage of all of the country's produce. I'd be a little reluctant to say because I'm not sure. But um, if, if you have a serious economic or some sort of geological problem in California, it will affect the world. Um, I remember when I was doing a lot of financial work just about five or six years ago, I saw that California, as a state, had the eighth largest GNP in the world, the eighth largest gross national product. I believe that it uh, accounts for about 20% of the, uh, uh, the na- uh, gross national product uh, of this country. It's about 20%. Uh, right. Yeah. It's, it's huge. And that means, you know, you get the G7 funding nation, the largest uh, seven nations in the world that lend money. California is about the eighth largest country in the world, if you put it in perspective like that. Yet in one of the top 100 businesses in the eighth largest country in the world, pornography is in there. And the center of all pornography for the United States was the epicenter of the earthquake, Northridge, California. All right, Ted, look, I want to stop you there. Every line I have is ringing. People want to talk to you. Let's let them uh, get on the line. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Ted Flynn. Where are you calling from, please? Madison, Wisconsin. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, Ted, thanks a lot for being on the air. Uh, I, I've been a Catholic uh, all my life, and I've had a very unusual life. Um, I've been plagued with nightmares and visions that I never really understood. to perhaps verify something that I have, I guess, been feeling all my life and only recently have begun to, to completely understand. Uh, I communicate a lot with this show. I probably should buy art a new fax machine since I'm, I'm sure I'm one of the major people who burns it out regularly. But I, I really believe that there's going to be a pole shift. And the reason I believe it is, it's too long to, to go into on the air. But I note that even in the book of Isaiah, there is mentioned during the Battle of Armageddon that 
every, the battlefield freezes and the earth reels and rocks to and fro. And, and, uh, a famous Swami named Yogananda years ago once told his disciples that, that after a pole shift, the new equator would run from Boston, Massachusetts through Fairbanks, Alaska. And if you put a string around a globe yes. and, and mark that, you find that that the Middle East, where I believe Armageddon will occur, is actually becomes a pole. So I'll hang up and hear your answer off the air. And thanks a lot, Art, and thanks a lot, Ted. All right, thank you. A pole shift, scientifically it's been explained, would basically, in many areas, not all, but in many, simply wipe things clean. Ted? Well, I'll tell you, uh, when you get into the specifics, I feel uneasy on certain things. For instance, we are told that, uh, you know, there are secrets to many of these people, which has been very much standard throughout history. Many of these mystics receive secrets. Many of them receive visions. Many of them are able to tell things only at certain times as they are under spiritual direction, which is a very healthy thing. Here's what we do know. There is going to be an event, or several events, or cumulative events, that are going to change the world as we know it. Now, one thing we do say, and I'm always reluctant to say this, but it's in the messages, and it dates back all the way from the 5th and 6th and 7th century. It's going to be three days of darkness over the world. Now, for those who don't think that can happen, that was the ninth plague of, of Moses, and it speaks about darkness in Isaiah, and it speaks about darkness when Christ was on the cross for three hours, and it also speaks about darkness in Revelation. There is going to be some sort of catastrophic event that is bigger than almost anything in the world that has ever seen that is going to change life as we know it. Now, in that, it's also said two-thirds of humanity in the world perishes. That's very, very consistent. And, um, I don't even have a clue to, to how to, uh, explain this. Other than the fact that, you know, I'm in finance, uh, you know, for years. You know, up until just maybe the last year or two, just by event. Mm -hmm. But the greater the frequency of any event, it decreases the possibility of chance. And this is being said all throughout the world. Anybody who's ever gambled, anybody who's ever been into statistics, probability, mathematically, the greater the uh, frequency of an event, it decreases chance. And this is what I mean by the sociological, the sociological phenomena totally devoid of spirituality, that if you don't even believe anything spiritually, but if you're intellectually honest with yourself and read these messages, it's been happening because it shows it's true. All right. Adam, Rwanda, and Medjugorje, and Yugoslavia is just many, many examples. All right. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Ted Flynn. Hi. Hi. Um, I was listening to your show when you were talking about the three days of darkness. Yes. Where are you calling from? Uh, Seattle, Washington. All right. Actually, Lake Stevens, Washington. Yes. Um, I have been hearing some things about the Earth coming into the photon belt. Um, I'm not real sure what it is. It's real hard to find any kind of literature on it. I'm wondering if your guest knows anything about it or if you have heard anything about it. But when the Earth goes into this photon belt, there will be three days of darkness. Anything electrical will quit working. And I'm just wondering if you know anything about that. Fascinating. I've not heard, Jed. See, that's interesting. Uh, I've never heard of the term photon belt. But it's interesting. Uh, several of the messages. Again, I'm not a scientist. And uh, all that we do is we analyze um, and research what we think are the major prophecies, the major prophets, the major apparitions. And you have so said... We'll write them down. Yes, you, you have said, Ted, there right. will be no scientific explanation for what occurs. That's correct. There, uh, science will not be able to explain it. And it specifically says when you get along the lines of the warning and the miracle that uh, it will undeniably be a spiritual event explained spiritually. Well, that'll be good for the earth. Ted, stand by just a moment. When we come back, I'm going to ask him about something close to the heart of this audience.
And I think you may be surprised, maybe I will be surprised at the answer. But we'll ask them about UFOs. You may think your home's your castle, but back to our guest, Ted Flynn. Ted is talking about Catholic prophecy. Ted, uh, a lot of people in this audience, because of the nature of the program, uh, have seen UFOs. Many claim to have been abducted by creatures from elsewhere, dimension or physically elsewhere. Um, what are these UFOs from the Catholic point of view? What are these creatures from a Catholic point of view? Do they exist? What is your view? Uh, I don't have a great deal of familiarity um, with UFOs, but if, if I were to, uh, and first of all, what the Catholic view is to UFOs, I don't think I've ever read it, and I'm, and I'm very, very well read in philosophy, theology, scripture, and some other things, so I don't think I've seen anything, but if you take a look at, you know, there are angels, there are, there's, you know, there's a heaven, there's a hell, and there's different, you know, dimensions. Um, in scripture, any single time a person came in contact with an angel, there is generally an initial, some sort of startled uh, response, or some sort of response that of apprehension, or could this be, am I seeing something? Yes. But generally what happens immediately, the angel will say, fear not. And generally then there is a, a period of great peace. Wherever there are angels or some sort of heavenly bodies, uh, there are, is great peace. And this is a sign of, of, a, of a spirituality from God. The, re the real thing. Peace and love. That you can, you know, it's not dissension, it's not disunity, it's not anger or fear. From what I've read about UFOs, and I'm not particularly up on the subject, but uh, generally about UFOs, of what I have read is just kind of general press. Um, there's been mutilations. That's right. There have been uh, certain, many times, organs cut out. Oftentimes, I believe, right. sexual organs. That's right again. Um, crop marks of. Uh, even in very, very large fields, and some sort of symmetry and some sort of order even to those. I take it you would generally not think of these things as... As angels. Uh, I don't see, because many of the times you mention abduction. That's right. Um, there is generally fear around a great deal of these UFO sightings. There's uh, disunity. There's all sorts of what I would think many times are negative words. That answers the question very well indeed, uh, Ted. Hold on, we're at the bottom of the hour. Ted Flynn is my guest. His book, The Thunder of Justice, if you'll get a piece of paper, we'll tell you how to get it in a moment. <laughs> This hour of Art Bell is recorded for rebroadcast at this time. Here's Art Bell. Now again, here I am, and boy, have I got a mind-curling question for Ted Flynn. So get ready, Ted. I've, uh, I've got something for those of you who like uh, something a little different. Right? Well, here's yet another one. Ted, um, with what has occurred in Oklahoma City, well, first of all, as you may know, uh, militias have formed up in many states around the country. Uh, gatherings of people who, for whatever reason, are training and preparing and generally fear the government. It's a hot topic on my weekly show. And it now looks as though the government is going to, at one level or another, move against these militias. It is a very dangerous time in America. Uh, what do you see coming of this? There are those who suggest it could be the beginning of a, a social revolution of some sort, uh, that there could be a lot of bloodshed. How does it figure in, Ted? Well, it's interesting. The, um, watching the news over the last several nights, you can see that the, you know, that the Michigan military militia is the one that was uh, spoken about most prominently because these people from out that area or had some sort of affiliation with it. If you take a look at what they're about, 
they are basically a group or groups of people in the United States saying that the government is encroaching on our freedom. That's right. They're taking away our liberties. They, uh, we're being taxed to the hilt. We have Big Brother tracking us through social security numbers. They can tell where you eat, what kind of socks you wear, all sorts of things through your credit card. They have the ability to track really through communication very, very well. That there's a big paper trail. They know, you know, your health, everything about you. Yes. And, and that's fairly simple today through computers and, and very large databases on people through taxes, et cetera, et cetera. If you take a look at that, in the spiritual dimension, that's going to backfire in that direction, too, because many of the people who would be considered to be very conservative see the exact same things, but they just simply haven't taken up arms or are not as militaristic or, in essence, people being as aggressive as these militias. You're absolutely right. The militias are not uh, that big in number. Uh, in terms of people, I talked about 15, 20,000 in this. I mean, the government's got an awful lot of clout and it has all of the executive orders behind it to totally control the population at will. It does, but, uh, Ted, revolutions have been accomplished by tiny percentages of populations. Truly tiny. Uh, totally agree. Lenin's a very good example of that. Then they grow into very, very large numbers. Um, so is there a, uh, big clash that is probably about to occur? I, um, boy, it's interesting. We've been talking about that, that situation because if you took a look at somebody very conservative um, that holds a lot of the same views, and, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that, that our freedoms are basically being eroded bit by bit. You know, the world will not perish with a bang, but will go inch by inch. And um, the, the, the very conservative movement uh, in the... Uh, in the churches throughout the land basically believe a lot of the same things as the militia in philosophy, but not necessarily in execution. It's true. All and, right. And that's how I think it's going to backfire on a lot of conservative groups to where, yes, you can see persecution coming right now, I think. I think they're, they're going to give this guy, it looks like he's the uh, person responsible. He's probably going to get the death penalty very, very quickly. All right. Um, on the wild card line, you're on the air with Ted Flynn. Good evening. Where are you calling from? Please? Hi, Art, Randy, and Reno. What a show. Glad you're enjoying it. Great. Uh, you know, I've talked to you several times, and I, I'm a Christian, you know, and a pilot and all this. And so I hardly agree with exactly what Ted said. Uh, the only thing that I would slightly disagree with, I don't believe there's any secrets in the Bible. Uh, or any secrets that have been revealed to anybody. I think everything has really been revealed in the Bible itself. But at any rate, uh, I wanted to ask him what he thought about, again, he said he didn't have much uh, interest in UFOs or much knowledge about it, but I just wondered what he thought about that in regard to the rapture and using the uh, UFOs as an excuse. All right. Uh, the rapture, another good subject, uh, Ted. Does Catholic theology uh, embrace the rapture? No. Matter of fact, it, it's by and large... I was involved in the evangelical movement for about, uh, oh gosh, seven or eight years, somewhat in the bowels of it through a movement here, you know, and, and a very non-denominational and humanistic ring about it here in the Washington, D.C. area, and uh, familiar with almost all of the literature. And the rapture is actually a word that is really not used in Catholic circles at all. Uh, you know, what's spoken about, uh, and I'm not sure that actually the word is in the Bible, at least that I know of. And I, and I, I never say that, you know, something definitively in or out because there's a lot I don't know. But, um, uh, you know, where two are in the field and one is taken up and two are in the bed and, you know, and one is taken up. Yes. But, uh, it's not, it's not a word that is really used in, in, in Catholic circles at all. Okay, well let's forget the, the word then, and we'll update it and use a proism, uh, the great sucking sound. In the which, great sucking sound. That's going right. north rather than south. You, you got it. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully. Uh, but, um You, you, but from a Catholic perspective. From a Catholic uh, perspective, there, you know, there is a second coming which is spoken about in the creed and is spoken about in scripture, it's absolutely there. Uh, whether or not there is a rapture to where two go, or, you know, one go with, you know, one being left, uh, I don't know. But it is not something that is generally bandied about in any of the messages, 
in scripture, but it, or I'm sorry, it is in scripture where somebody goes, you know, to heaven as such. All right, uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Ted Flynn. Good evening. Uh, yes, uh, Richard calling from Youngstown, WKB at 57 on yes. AM. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> a few questions. I'm a doctoral candidate working on my theology degree, and I just... All right, would you please get off that portable phone and get on a real one? No problem. All right, thank you. Here I am. Um, just a quick question, a couple quick questions for Ted. Uh, Ted, what is your relationship with your local bishop or local Catholic community? Um, one, we just happened to have a, um, a magazine that is printed quarterly. Uh, they know we're here, but, you know, we're one, uh, we're in a county with about 700,000 people. Mm-hmm. Are, you, are you in the mainstream Roman Catholic Church or are you in one of the fringe groups? Um, well, as far as mainstream, we would can be considered to be pretty much a conservative Catholic. Uh, in a what is considered to be a very conservative diocese. Okay. Well, you probably, want the Archbishop of Thebes group? Or? Oh, no, no, not at all. Okay. You know, uh, it's one of the most conservative dioceses actually in the United States, though. Okay. And what type of theological training do you have? Right? It seems like you've read a lot. But have you been I've read a lot, but actually have uh, no training theologically at all. In fact, for me personally, I'm really not that interested in it. Personally, I read a lot. But when I look at the scriptures, I kind of see it really as a love letter from heaven to mankind. I don't really look at the philosophical side too much. Because you do realize, you know, the Catholic Church has a whole teaching office and a magisterium. And we really don't give too much weight to a lot of these private apparitions. And, and um, But that, that really does not seem true. The Catholic Church... Has uh, has it not Ted uh, sanctioned uh, or uh, I'm not even sure what the right word is, uh, but but uh, uh, well, given no, credibility up until, to up until Vatican II, you know most of the priests knew about Fatima and Lords and La Salette, but really if you look at a lot of the messages of people like Father Gobi, they're really speaking about the Church in a state of apostasy, and this is why where we are today. All right. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Ted Flynn. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Turn your radio oh, off wait, and uh, oh, delay. Wait, oh. and then please tell us where you're calling from. I'm calling from Grand Pass, Oregon. All right, K O P E. And I love your show. Thank you. I love your show, and I'd like to hear more about your weekly show. So plug it. <laughs> well, it's, it's on um, uh, Tuesday night through uh, Saturday morning from uh, eleven at night to four in the morning Pacific time. That's what I like to sleep. Anyway, this is my question. Because I've been listening in and out of uh, cleaning the van and everything. And my question is, what what do we do? What's the good positive side of all this? That's, that's a good question. I was hoping we'd get to that before we close. All right, there we are. Yeah, that's good, actually. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had a little note on that. Because it can, it can be a downer. And, you know, there is actually a very emotional side to this that, frankly, I liken to the stages of Kubler-Ross's death and dying. Denial, and, and I think we're all in different parts of this, with her five stages of death and dying, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, or acceptance. Once we realize it appears that these events are going to happen, we, 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 we go through an emotional stage that is somewhat almost, um, if we're open and we see it, we're going to hopefully get to joyfully living this mystery. We're in a deep, deep mystery. And hopefully we're going to joyfully get to that part of acceptance. Now, how do we do it? What's the hope? The hope is we are told worldwide, and we, we talked very early on, on how there's unanimous messages from people from around the world. The hope is that if we're living the messages, if we're living the gospel. And it's been said by these people that there's nothing new being said that's not in Scripture. These people are always quoting Scripture. And that if we're being obedient, there's absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing to fear. It is totally living joyfully in the present moment of the day. And that's very reassuring. Well, it is. Um, Ted, I'm going to make you say it. Uh, how do they, the name of your book is The Thunder of Justice. And if people wanted it, how do they get it? 
there's an organization who is the distributor who is actually right next to me in the building, but it's an organization called Signs of the Times. Mm -hmm. That is actually the name also of their quarterly magazine. It's, it's actually one that my wife runs and she prints on a quarterly basis. And it's about 65, 70 pages per quarter of, an essence, trying to stay up with a lot of this phenomena around the world. The name of the organization is Signs of the Times. It's 109 Executive Drive, Suite D, as in David, Sterling, Virginia, 20166, with the phone being area code 703-742-39. 39, and the facts, the last four digits, are 0808. So again, that's Signs of the Times, 109 Executive Drive, Suite D, Sterling, Virginia, 20166, 742 3939. Um, all right. Um, now, is, how, when is that telephone manned? Um, oh, pretty much from around. Eight in the morning until usually around seven, eight at night. All right, there you have it. Area code seven zero three seven four two three nine three nine. Or uh, if you want facts, the last four digits would be zero eight zero eight. All right, um, Ted, uh, hold on just a moment. We'll come back and do the final segment. Do you remember a time when you could take a penny to the corner grocery store and be able to buy a nice piece of candy or maybe even a postcard? Of course, today, the convenience stores keep a bowl of pennies on the counter with a sign that says, take one if you need one. Can the dollar be far behind? You really can't buy anything for a penny anymore. In fact, a dollar will only buy what a dime would buy just a few years ago. The only form of money that still buys everything it used to is gold. Over 100 years ago... An ounce of gold traded for $20. And with it, you could buy a really nice new suit. Today, guest mentioned large chunks of ice, actually hail, that fell on China. However, no one mentioned the one that fell in Los Angeles last week. It was reported that a large chunk of ice fell from the sky and crushed an automobile in Los Angeles. The incident is being ignored by the news media. That's from Pete in Santa Barbara. An odd little thing, uh, indeed, uh, Ted. Are there more and more of these odd little things occurring around the world now? Yeah, as a matter of fact, the, the odd things are going to increase. We're going to see that. You know, uh, you were mentioning earlier a little bit about time and future. That probably the most famous message of all that I was, I, I actually neglected to mention was the one that this father Gobi had given to the world on September 18, 1988. And that was? And that said that all would come to completion, including the great tribulation in these next ten years. Huh. And it's called, the name of the message, which is actually several pages, is called These Ten Years. All that I have prophesied since La Salette will come to completion, including the great tribulation. So we're looking, you know, to where it has been said that these next 10 years from 1988 to 98, of which we don't speculate, but it's been given that they're going to be very, very tumultuous, catastrophic, and some fairly severe events that I personally think the, the extraordinary will become ordinary. And literally, almost everything you've played on your news tonight hmm. has been along that vein. It is true. Of which has been flat out which years ago would have been considered almost incomprehensible to nevertheless believe, but worse, watch every night on television, which is the extraordinary, which is the kind of the, the far-out stuff that's being observed every single night on television. This will increase. It's the quickening. That's exactly what it's the birth pangs of Matthew 24. The birth pangs before the second coming. It's the birth pangs. Ted, uh, we've got to go. I, I don't know how to thank you. I, uh, it's eerie what you've had to say uh, in, in view of many of the people that I've had on this program from all callings. I'm telling you what you're saying is eerie. Ted, it's been a pleasure. I hope, I hope you sell a billion books. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, thank you very much, and we'll have you back again, Ted. Well, listen, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Take care. A couple of final notes um, as we uh, as we go away here, and they are the following. We have um, we have a service available that I'd like you to utilize, whether it is to order our newsletter, to order a program uh, that we've done here. For example, you can now order Ted Flynn's program, the one you just heard. You can order any program that we've done on Dreamland simply by making a telephone call. At this same number, you may also order our newsletter. It's called After Dark, and it is fabulous. So to order a program or to order the newsletter, please call 1-800-917-4278. 24 hours a day, including right now, 1-800-917-4278. And uh, to repeat an earlier note, all of those photographs, about 14 of them now, including, by the way, a photograph of the studio from which I'm now broadcasting, are all GIF files available at the following phone number. Area code 702-727-1700. It is a computer bulletin board, so obviously you've got to have a computer and a modem to uh, participate. Area code 702, this is a good 24 hours a day, 702-727-1709. Put in your name and such. When you get to the main menu, hit J space 11, and it will all be there in front of you. I want to thank you all on behalf of everybody that makes Dreamland possible. Thank you, and from the high desert, good night. This has been Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not back. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland. Although much of the United States...